Welcome to the space where creators have aligned a positive and intellectual collab of open minds. For sharing and learning from one another, it's a vibe. We give us a podcast on the mic. Subscribe, educators, spitting bars. I guess you didn't know I'm multifaceted and humble, taking off life goals. The classroom is my comfort zone where I plant and sow. Seeds of knowledge, compassion, empathy, and hope. Reading is the key to unlocking your potential. Countless benefits, including positive and mental. Regardless of the genre, books are highly influential. Go get yours, I'll get mine. Make you strive. Money mental. Come rock with me and get down to this new jam. Yeah. Yeah. Between my friends, I had a very simple plan. Educate the masses through books and life lessons. It's a grand slam. I'm out. Salo for lava, Kiora, and welcome to the Reads of Russell podcast. Can you tell it, Ron? I'm really excited. I'm so excited. I'm trying not to fangirl. On today's show, we have a Kaitahu Taranaki based writer. She is the author of Ruin, her debut collection of short stories, which was published by Teherenga Waka University Press in March this year. Her work has appeared in literary journals and anthologies in New Zealand and overseas. At the time of this interview, she is joining us from her four week writing residency in Australia as the recipient of the 2023 New Zealand Australia Residency Exchange, where she is working on her next book. It is my honor to welcome to the show, Emma Hislop. <laughs> welcome, welcome. No my, hello my, how are you, Emma? <laughs> oh, kia ora, talofa. Thanks for having me. I'm really well, it's really nice to be here. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's an honor to have you on the show. I'm excited. As I said off, off the camera, I ah, try not to fangirl, mm-hmm. trying to get a grip over here. <laughs> but before we go into this, Emma, I'd like to ask our guests just to, you know, I, I pretty much gave the standard introduction, but I know you have a better one prepared for us. So go mm-hmm. ahead. <laughs> uh, kia ora koutou, uh, ko hikaroro te moka, ko waikawaiti te awa, ko uruao, ko a- Arai Teru Turu ko Takitimu Kawaka ko Kati Huirapa me kai te ruahikihiki ka hapu ko Pukiteraki te marae ko Kaitahu te iwi uh, ko Emma Hislop Toku Ikua and um, yeah as you mentioned I am lucky enough to currently live in Taranaki um, in Namotu and Really nice to be here, Rosa. Thanks. Kia ora. Oh. <laughs> well, I guess, um, you know, I've, I have I made this list of things when I was researching, Emma, actually. So mother, daughter, writer, of course, a lifelong learner. You've been on this writing journey. I, I want to say this because I've had, um, you know, other authors, writers on the show, and it's not just something that you just wake up suddenly like, oh, I'm going to publish a book. Many of you many of you have been writing for years um, and then you're finally releasing this collection. So when did this writing journey start for you? When did you know you were going to be a writer? Um, yeah, just before I start on that, I just mm. want to mihi to you, Rosa, too, for this podcast series oh. because I really, really get so much out of um, them and I just love hearing other writers um, korero about writing and you know their lives and things and it's just it's it's a real talka so kamahinui ki a koe. Um, my I, I always sort of take it back to when I was about third form at secondary school I had a, um, a an amazing English teacher called Diane Kawana um, who has sadly now passed um, she died of cancer a few years ago but she was instrumental in encouraging me to um, encouraging me really. She told me that she loved my stories and she always um, gave me detailed and really thoughtful feedback. Um, And she kind of instilled in me this, this belief, I suppose, to sort of give things a go and, you know, um, yeah. So that's probably where it started way, way back. (laughs) <laughs> mm. and then did you go I mean I know you've got a master's in creative writing like how I was just wondering because I've had you know we talk about um support in the classroom like I've had guests on here we talk about you know where did your uh love for your craft start and so you've just shared that but I was wondering 
in terms of the confidence like how how do you keep that going like was there a continuous um support or network of people throughout your education that kind of continue to guide you to help you understand that yes you can be a writer um you can be anything you want as maori you know do you know what i mean like as i, I feel like as maori and pacifica it's hard to to stay motivated to sometimes people don't have support sometimes we do so for you you know was that a continuous um aspect of your journey like part of your journey where you had like just different mentors along the way or did you ever find yourself just questioning wait can I really be a writer like can I really make a career out of this and get my voice uh, out that's there? a really good question actually and something um I, I guess I haven't thought about that much till till right now but I um the imposter syndrome in me is yes. very strong. In all of <laughs> um, us. <that's, that's>, mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I battle with that a lot. Like I was just talking, I, I'm sharing this this um, space with three three other writers, two from Northern Ireland um, and one from Shanghai in China. And um, we were talking last night over dinner about about imposter syndrome you know um and it's also it's, it's it's reassuring to hear that other writers um experience it as well um but like a lot of people probably like in my 20s i i had um when i was traveling around the place here um like in aotearoa and overseas i um i always kept a sort of a a writing journal mm -hmm. um and I didn't really have mentors as such, I wouldn't say, until um, I, I applied. I decided I was back in New Zealand after over a decade living overseas in South London, mostly in Brixton. And um, some friends encouraged me to apply for the, um, for the MA. And I applied and I didn't get in the first time, so I just encourage people to keep applying for things if you don't first get it. Um, and then I wasn't going to apply again, and then I ran into a friend in town one day, and um, they were like, oh, I hope you're going to get that application in, you know, it closes tomorrow. And um, so I just sort of chucked an application in at the last minute, and then I got on that year. So that was mm. 2013. And that's probably when I started writing like more seriously because we had to um, have a have a manuscript at the end of the year, so um, it was quite a it was quite a lot of words on the page that you had to get down, you know. Yeah. Mm. It, were you able to like study and focus totally on your studies, or was it still trying to balance a full time job, family commitments, you know? Yeah, I um, I had just moved out to Moera in the in Lower Hutt, um, and I was living right by Te Awa Kairangi, mm -hmm. um, and I was relief teaching at the time. Um, I, I was doing quite a lot of teaching at Te Aro School in, in 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 the city, so that was quite good. I think we were able, I was able to sort of work like three days a week as well as do the masters, and that was sort of giving me you know money to cover some rent and bills and stuff yeah but um some people I think I'm not sure if anyone was working full-time mm. it was pretty um it was pretty intense that workload right but, I can know, imagine all... yeah um in terms of books and uh writers at the time where you were getting inspiration from can you recall any standouts like these are some of the authors I was going to this is where I was kind of getting my inspiration from while you were doing your masters I, I was also talking about this last night that um everyone seemed so well read compared to me um and talk, you know a lot of people talked about writers that I had never heard of so I was mm. introduced to a lot of um writers that year um and I made some really close friendships that year. Um, Raki Syed, who's an amazing writer and filmmaker, she was in the class. Um, and she introduced me to a lot of 
like the sort of great um, big American writers. Mm. Um, I'm going to struggle to think of any off the top of my head, but I was just, yeah, I was just sort of getting my hands on whatever I could. And uh, um, that there's a good library up mm. up at the um, on the master's course too. So I would spend hours in the library, look, you know, like um, yeah, reading reading books and finding out the sort of style of work that I liked. Mm. I see your um your tamoko and I was I actually read the article you wrote uh tamoko about your story and I was wondering if you could share a little bit about um yeah just your fucker papa and 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 that yeah I I I had always known that I wanted to um get tamoko if I ever finished my book mm. <laughs> and the book um, took me 10 years to write, I, um, which seems like a long time. I, mm. I had a chronic illness though for four years and also had a baby in that time and also moved house. So people remind me of that sometimes. Um, mm. But yeah, so I, um, once I'd finished the book, Oh, it was yeah. Once I'd finished the book, I got in touch with um, Fanoka um, James York, who's um, well, he's a master carver primarily, but um, also um, just to ask if he would be willing to, you know, um, ink me up at some stage. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually, he's he's predominant like predominantly carving these days. So it it took a while to sort of like I think I just kind of kept hassling him <laughs> and then he, he picked me up um I flew down to Invercargill where he's living and um yeah I I sort of said sorry for hassling you but he said he gets a lot of requests but um you know he just kind of wanted to make sure that I was serious about it I think and we had a few different corridor about it and um and my sister came down with me for that she met me down there which was a, was a really special trip not mm. least because she's um she was recovering from bowel cancer and she's all good now but um mm. yeah we went down and we sort of spent spent a few days doing that and just went to James's house for the day and sat with his mum and their dog and yeah it was it was it was really special Oh. You know, while we since you mentioned it, let's talk about Ruin. Let's just get let's get into it and talk <laughs> about Ruin and other stories, your debut collection of short stories. And I mean, like you said, 10 years. 10 years where a lot had happened in your own life, but you're writing 10 years of work. At what point do you finally make that goal and go, that's it, that's gonna be the date, March 2023? Or is that from the publisher? That date? Um I had always wanted to have 13 stories mm. <laughs> um, only because my teacher at the time, my, my supervisor, um, Emily Perkins, whose writing I admire greatly, um, she mm. had 13 stories in her first collection, so I just <laughs> set myself that goal. And it was really when I, when I had kind of finished, um, you know, I got to 13 and I was kind of happy with them. I, um, yeah, th that was when I sent sent the collection off to Te Hiringa Waka. Mm. Um, I, I sent the I sent the manuscript to them first because I've built a bit of a relationship there over the years. I've um, yeah. always been really supportive, and the, they had published a few stories of mine in like anthologies and yeah editions of sport and other things so yeah I, I kind of wanted to give them the first call on it and um mm. yeah and luckily they said yes I was so curious about the connection because it's not easy you know with any of the university presses right yeah when it was released I was like Wowzers, this is huge <laughs> <laughs> yeah I was I was incredibly lucky to have um Pip Adam as yes. as a mentor for the last six months of the project and um she undoubtedly made, she asked me the really hard questions about the work and got me to interrogate it at a, at a deeper level, I think. Mm. And um, we just worked methodically kind of through the stories until until I felt like it was ready to go. Mm. And um, so I'm really grateful to Pip because, yeah, super lucky to have her do that.
Yeah, in terms of the themes of the stories that you have in your collection, how does a writer go about bringing together this body of work over a large number of years? Were you reworking constantly towards particular themes or were you just like, okay, this is my mood, this is the feeling right now, I'm going to go with it? Yeah, that's a good question. It's interesting to me because I just was not going in for any particular themes Mm -hmm. I was just writing like often the stories start with like what I call as a kind of a kernel of truth and then lift off I remember Mm -hmm. Emily Perkins saying it's sort of that liminal space between truth and fiction where that really interesting Mm -hmm. stuff happens and um, so most of my stories start with a a bit of truth and then just a bit (laughs) And then I love I love how anything can happen in fiction. Mm. Um, it's been fascinating to me that since the book's come out, like the way it's read is that it's, um, you know, it has certain themes. Mm. Um, I think it was Pip towards the end of the mentorship. She said to me, there are a lot of terrible men in this book. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was just like, when you say the truth, I'm like, Okay, Rosa, don't ask, but ask. Yeah, yeah, the, the terrible men, the men in this book. Um, continue, continue, Emma. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. Like, my dad won't read the book because he, I think he thinks he's in it. But in, like, actual, in, actual, in actual fact, he's not in it, just his dog's in it. Like, mm. so, yeah. Um, and, and so it was... It was kind of a revelation to me, which seems like, God, I must be so thick. But I kind of <laughs> sat down and went through the collection and I was like, oh, Pip's right. You know, there are a lot of terrible men in the book. And so, you know, and since it's come out, it's kind of been framed in this way. So I feel like the mm. readers have kind of um, sort of made the collection what it is in some ways, because I, I, I honestly wasn't aware of that. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, OK, did I? I was researching and going, is it just me? No, it's not just me. Okay, reading some reviews. Oh, it's definitely not just me. Okay. (laughs) Who are these men? But I like how you talk about a little bit of truth and then the stories evolve and can go anywhere because uh, there's like, you mentioned London, right? You lived a large part of your life in London. So that makes the whole, that's the London connection and then New Zealand and then that space kind of that is so cool. That is so cool, Emma. <laughs> um, so did you write, so 13 was the goal. I love that. Did you write more than 13 and have to like cut it down and go, these are the 13 pieces? Or did you literally go, no, 13 is it? I'm writing for 13. There were a few earlier stories that didn't mm-hmm. kind of seem to, um, they just didn't kind of make it into the later drafts. Mm-hmm. Like I just wasn't um interested enough in carrying on but mm. mostly most of the collection is the are the stories that I started in 2013 and oh. some of them went through different a lot of different kind of iterations and rewrites and stuff um mm. there was one particular story that I was stuck on for a number of years the sort of ending like I'd, mm. I'd wanted to have lots of different points of view or two or three I think but I'm not sure I'm still not sure of how this would work in short fiction um Mm. so I just yeah I changed it to one point of view and then it became clearer to me what I needed to do yeah Mm. Um, how would you describe your writing um I just again want to tell people that you have been doing you've done so many different types of writing like you're not just okay she's put out a collection no fam if you are listening and watching check the bio for where you can buy Emma's book but also I'll be linking some really cool articles that I read and I really enjoyed one thing that surprised me and made me really happy when uh, after since the books come out is that mm. I got quite a lot more work offers um like to write for online publications and things like that which has been awesome because I'm I work from home and I have numerous kind of freelancing jobs Mm -hmm. so that's added to that um and then a few more opportunities came along to sort of teach some things um because I think as a writer you're always 
trying to work out how you can work and write and live. Um, yeah, you've got to pay the bills and rent yep. and all of that, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so the nonfiction work writing I've been doing is pretty new to me, to be honest, and I've mm. really um, enjoyed it. It's kind of stretching me in a different direction. Um, mm. Yeah, and also, like, I, I, yeah, I mean, I see it as an opportunity, hopefully, to kind of, like, platform and uplift other Māori writers, if mm. wherever possible. We've had other Māori and Pacifica authors on here, you know, uplifting others, uh, thinking about emerging writers, uh, thinking about ways to inspire up-and-coming writers, young writers, you know, getting young people interested and excited about writing and reading such important mahi you know something that I've noticed recently actually maybe over the last year or so or maybe it's just something I've just noticed is the covers of these books that have been released by Maori and Pacifica writers there's always a story behind it and so I wanted to ask about the cover for your book for Ruin can you tell us um because there's always a reason why a cover is chosen. So if you could just please share and uh, maybe shout out the 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 artist or, yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, I was really um, amazed at how um, open Te Hiringa Waka were to kind of mm. hearing my ideas and requests and stuff for the um, cover. I knew that I wanted to have a Māori um, artist and um, my editor Anna Knox and I looked at a few different things but I kept coming back to Mayangi Waitai who um, is originally from Whanganui she now lives in uh, Wellington but um, I've admired her work for years and we have a lot of friends in common in fact she's really good friends with Colleen um, Maria Lenehan who mm. launched my book so yeah, I approached Mayangi and um, <clears throat> she was willing to let me use that uh, work, which is called When Pushed Pull, mm. um, a 2015 work. And it seemed to encapsulate the ideas that I was trying to get at in the book, <clears throat> um, that sort of tension that a lot of the characters feel <clears throat> when they're put under pressure. Mm. Yeah, um, I also loved how colourful it was. Yes, I <laughs> loved that too. And then I researched, I was like, I need to find out, like, why why this cover, but the artwork, beautiful. Mm. So beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah. Good choice. Really, really Very beautiful. good choice. And um, it's so nice to hear that, um, you know, the, the that you had, you were able to, you know, have a say in getting that cover yeah. done. Because I know, you know, I've, heard that it's not always the case that sometimes you're given some friendly suggestions by these you know the people in charge so yay I'm glad mm -hmm. you got that through I was wondering about um because there is a story called ruin in the book did you go through a couple of name changes uh was that something you chatted with your mentors and and editors about did you come up did you just decide okay and no, I think ruin kind of you know, I don't know. How did you come up with the, how did you decide that it was going to be Ruin and then right, and other yeah. stories? That was quite a late in the piece decision. Um, oh. I actually think Pip suggested it, possibly. It had been called so many different things. It was called Cold Harbour. Cold Harbour Lane is in Brixton and I used to oh. sort of, you know, <laughs> walk up and down there a lot. Um, and I remember people in my MA class were like, no, that's really, you know, <laughs> depressing kind of thing. Um, and, yeah, I, we floated a few ideas. I think it was Red Flags was another one. But I just, yes, when, when Ruin came up, I really felt like, well, I love one uh, word titles. Oh. Um, and I love how Ruin can be, you know, it's, um, it's sort of, it can be the sort of decay and the end of something but also from from the breakdown of things or the end mm. of things often there are new beginnings and mm. so I felt like it kind of um yeah it was like 
you can also have hope from ruin, I think. Yes. If, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you mentioned red flags. I was like, I really like this story. But now I'm thinking about it, I'm like, red flags, ruin, no, ruin. Just, yeah, it just, I think, as a whole, speaks to the whole collection. So, yeah, <laughs> good choice. Good choice with ruin. But I love red flags, just saying. Okay, so um, what do you want readers, you know, like what do you want other readers to learn maybe um, from reading your your short stories? What do you want them to take away from it? Um. Well, I, I I really hope that it's a more helpful book than a harmful book. I have, um, we talked at the publishers about whether we needed to have a trigger warning, but then when my editor, Anna Knox, wrote the, the sort of blurb for the book, um, mm. it kind of seemed to be almost that. So we um, we went with that. Um I don't know. I guess if if you know women, and I say that in in terms of inclusivity and mm. all our trans and non-binary friends, obviously um, re read it and you know find things in it that they relate to or you know um, identify with or mm. even just enjoy for pure kind of entertainment's sake in terms mm. of the reading experience. That would be that would be really amazing, but I, 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 I don't really have any, any hopes for what. It's really hard to know what individual right. readers take from a, you know. Right. That's why it's been amazing to get all the feedback from mm. from people who have read it. It's just been, yeah, really, really affirming. And and you know, you mentioned Dad earlier. You know, he doesn't want to read the book in case he, he's trying to figure <laughs> out if he's in there. What was the reaction from friends and you know family? I mean, ten years of um, hard work, man. That's you know, what was their reaction to it? Oh, I've just been super lucky to have like support from Fano and friends. Mm -hmm. Like um, I mentioned, I think being chronically ill for four years, and and that was when Lenny, my son, was little, and um, we moved up to Taranaki to be closer to my parents so that they could help out, and um. Yeah, like I just don't think I would have completed the book if um, we hadn't had such such kind of good good support there. And um, yeah, I'm really lucky. I've got a supportive partner too, Muz. He's um, he's I mean he works full time, but he's he's also I mean he he's kind of the reason that I'm here in, at the moment um, mm. on the residency because. Um, you know, he's Lenny's eight, so he's at home doing that. And, and, um, yeah, they, they were able to come. The, the other thing is, is this residency. I urge people to apply for it because I think it comes up every year. Mm. And amazingly, it, it came with a very generous stipend of $4,000. So, mm. um, it meant that Muzz and Lenny were able to come to Sydney for a long weekend and meet me, oh. whereas I wouldn't have been able to have a month away from you know my my kid um otherwise mm -hmm. and I've yeah I really like I have a lot of um friends and single mum friends right who are writers and um you know it's really difficult to kind of accommodate like you know mm -hmm. um residencies generally aren't set up for for parents and certainly not single parents so yeah Mm. Well, how is the residency going? Let's talk about this. So again, I just want to mention uh, Emma, you know, she was a recipient of this New Zealand, uh, 2023 New Zealand Australia Residency Exchange. It's a writing residency. Uh, it also said that you're, have you appeared already at the Blue Mountain Writers Festival or is that coming up? It's coming up in two weeks. Yeah. Yes. How's everything going there? I mean, it's so great to hear that your family were able to come out. Um you said you've had some, you know, you've been bonding with these other writers. I mean, wow, the environment right now sounds like you're in a really good space to be doing some writing for a new book. <laughs> Tell us how it's going. I mean, if you can, if you can, you know, please don't, don't, don't have to give us an exclusive for the Reads of Russell podcast. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, it's, um, honestly, I'm still pinching myself. I've been here like, two weeks and mm. um 
sharing this beautiful big old house in the Blue Mountains with um, wow. Jan Carson, from who's an amazing writer from Northern Ireland, and um, Betsy Cornwell, who's American originally but has been living in Ireland for um, a decade, I think, mm -hmm. and um, Zhaning Zhao from Shanghai. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are two weekly writers, um, Australian writers, who change weekly. So we're getting to kind of have wow. meet a lot of different people and have interesting conversations, you know. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I I apply for things all the time and um, I thought I was seeing things when I got the email from the Michael King Centre mm -hmm. to um, I was walking my dog on the beach when, and I just, my initial response was, oh, there's no way I can do that, you know, I can't sort of leave my jobs and whānau responsibilities and um, kid and stuff. And then um, it was my dad, actually. He sent me an email saying, I think we should all pull out all stops to try and ensure that you can go and do this. And that Aww. meant a lot to me. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, so everybody did. Everybody's kind of pulled out all stops, and including my sister who's in Pōneke. And, um, wow. yeah just like really helped so I'm stoked and I'm it's amazing how much work I can get done un, uninterrupted you know mm. I've been waking up at five and having some coffee and working till eight then going for a run then coming back and you know it's just yeah it makes me realize how busy life is usually um yeah I think you know with a young family and mm. jobs and dog and all of that um but it's amazing so I'm yeah I'm having a go at writing um the second or third draft of my um novel <laughs> which is a very different beast to yes uh, so I was gonna story. say with the short <laughs> stories like how are you finding that is it a change in pace or is it really like slowing right down and saying okay different path here let's let's yeah I don't know yeah yeah like I think I spent the first year um um thinking I could write short stories on the kind of subject and stick them all together <laughs> but um that was quite good in terms of getting me thinking about the characters and different points of view and things but then I started to run into problems so now I'm um redrafting it and starting from scratch and not looking at any of the the previous uh work that I've done just starting from the beginning and that's actually been really good so um, I'm really enjoying it it's stretching my brain and making mm. me work hard <laughs> um yeah so yeah I'm really really grateful to be here you know, you talked about, um, you keep mentioning, um, you mentioned, uh, every time you mentioned Pip, I'm like, oh, Pip. <laughs> Pip, Adam, I mean, you, you, oh man, not just as a, as a woman, but as a Maori writer, um, being in spaces where you get to work with people like Pip, you mentioned Conleen earlier, who's a good friend of yours, I mean, everyone these are just like some amazing writers emma's not saying but oh my god you like you you're you just you it sounds like you've got a network of just really great writers around you what is it like to work with you know your friend colleen who's a writer pip mentor and friend wow how amazing mm. is that it is i'm really super lucky i um it was actually at the um Te Ha Hui in Porirua in 2019 mm -hmm. that um, Nadine and Hura and a lot of other people were instrumental in kind of organising. Um, and I wasn't going to go because I had real imposter syndrome and like all those kind of colonial embedded thoughts like mm. I'm not Māori enough and I don't know anyone and all of that stuff. Uh, and it was Pip who encouraged me to go. Um, and I'm so grateful I went and I'm, I met a lot of, a lot of people there who are, you know, I'm, I'm grateful now to call friends. Like there's a list of so many people um, and they're all incredible writers, you know, mm. Nadine herself, 
Anahira Gildare was there running mm. workshops. Um, Cassandra Barnett, you know, Sinead Overby, Michelle Rahura, who SMA, wow. Rana Piri. I mean, I could go on. I probably, <laughs> Nicole Titihuia. I've probably um, missed a lot of people out, you know, and mm. also um, I got to do a workshop with Witi Ihimaira and Patricia Grace was there and mm. um, everybody was oh calling around gosh. to Pat. It was just really good. And so once, when I got home to Taranaki, a few of us decided to set up a Taranaki branch of Te ha. Oh, And that's nice. been super cool because, you know, a lot of us are mums juggling numerous jobs and writing like um, Steph Mataku and Cassie Hart are both <gasps> local. What? And, um, Stop yeah. now. Oh. Oh, I've learned so much from Steph and Cassie because oh they're goodness. like heavyweights. In the, in the kind of business of it, you know, and I'm always asking questions. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I follow these people. I'm just a bit, okay. Wow. Yeah, I know. I was, yeah. <laughs> so, and, wow. um, you know, Aidan Anade was there too. So he's he's um, he's everywhere at the moment with his, his debut novel, which is awesome to see. So, yeah, it's a good it's a good spot to be. And we always welcome more people. So if you, mm. if anyone watches this and they're local to Taranaki, like please, yeah, get in touch and come along because it's it's super chill. We just have coffee and um, some kai and just talk about things. Not even writing things half time, just life things. <laughs> just catching up on gossip, life things. There is nothing wrong with that, and there are definitely no judgments coming from me. <laughs> <laughs> So building community, building these relationships, you know, thinking about the next generation of Māori writers. I mean, it sounds great. You know, you're setting up, you've got your own local branch there. It's so cool to hear there are people out there doing that mahi because I was curious, um, you know, having you come on the show, I was so curious to know, yeah, where's everyone at in terms of like uplifting and, you know, bringing along the next group of emerging Māori writers. It's so great to hear you guys are doing that mahi. Is it all over New Zealand or is it just in, <laughs> does, yeah, what, what do you know about that? I think it's, I think it's everywhere. I think as, particularly as Māori, you mm. know, relationships are everything and mm. um, connections are so important. And yeah, I'm just, super grateful I mean there are also I don't know I'm always kind of looking for ways to connect up with people you know there's also um Shelley Burnfield and Helen Walker and in, in, over in Hawke's Bay you know and we've never I've I've met Helen before but I've never actually met Shelley in in real life yet but we sort of have have quite regular zooms and and things I just feel like it's especially you know writing can Otherwise, writing can be super lonely mm. <laughs> and um, it's just nice to kind of talk about some of the issues we're faced with, I suppose, when 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 writing and, um, yeah, writing as, as Māori, I suppose. Mm. Um, like I sat down to read uh, my, my copy of Te Awa Kupu lately, an anthology right. that paired with another... Yeah. Um, book and ah, oh, I just was so like blown away by the by the work in there, you know. And um, mm. yeah, contacted some of the writers to tell them. Like, t I love Tina Makareti's story so much, and there were other other people as well, James George, and just I feel like I don't know. It's just nice to to get in touch with people, you know. I was saying to um, Issa lately that it would be really nice to organize a sort of a hui maybe mm. just maybe just rent a a batch or something halfway between i don't know where people are although people are scattered so yeah and just even just get together for the weekend and walk on the beach and stuff and, and they were super keen so we might might try and organize that for early next year that's so cool it's such a new zealand thing i love that we'll just yeah. you know get onto the beach and chill <laughs> fishing chips yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, um, you get imposter syndrome, you know, that's come up, um, throughout the podcast. Uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, not being Maori enough, 
you know, wondering, you know, and it made me think about when you turn up to spaces, whether it be community or professional spaces or literary spaces, do you have um, a power suit <laughs> or maybe even a piece of jewelry or something that you wear that it just, no one needs to know, but you're like, I'm here in the space and you know what? my voice is going to be counted. I'm here for a reason. Like, do you have something, a power suit or an outfit or accessory that you wear to these different spaces that just gives you that extra bit of strength mm. and, and, and power to like really be like, I'm here to be counted? That's a nice question. I, um, I always wear my... Naitahu earrings. Ah. My sister gave them to me, and she's got a matching pair. <laughs> nice. And um, yeah, I guess I guess that's a that's that's a work in progress, you know. Um, but I think um, recently, I it was about six months ago, and I was enrolled in an online um, Wananga Reo mm. course. Um, for which I was like super grateful, you know, free mm. course. Um, but I found myself like always being behind and in the evenings I'd be sitting in my bedroom on Zoom um, mm. while my family were in another room doing something else. And it just seemed really kind of separate from our life, our home life. And um, it was Matua Hemi. Hirimi, who um, we were doing, a, um, oh, it was the spin-off. We were doing a series of essays and and he wrote one. And so we were sort of um, emailing a bit back and forth. And, and he said to me that um, maybe I just needed to kind of give myself a bit of a break and that, you know, I didn't need to put so much pressure on myself, I think, to... Mm -hmm. Um, like, like that it wasn't kind of a commodity to be sort of, um, it was a lifelong journey, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I actually ended up, um, withdrawing from the course and I've started to just, um, you know, do it a little bit every day, actually mm. with this <laughs> book instead and, and, okay. um, you know, and, and, and playing some card games and things at home with Lenny and mm. I don't know I just yeah like just um incorporating it into my life rather than it was feeling like a very separate kind of thing that I had to achieve right so, yeah I'm grateful for the guidance of um yeah guidance of people who are older <laughs> and mm. and have that wisdom and also um Modaka Edwards who's um at our Runaka uh, at Pukiteraki. Um, he's been super supportive of, of um, me and my Fano when we've visited down there. And, you know, dad and my sister came last year down with me and it was a really special trip, I think, just trying to sort of make connections where, where possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was good. Do you have a favourite place to write uh, when you're at home? Are you a desk type person or are you out on the I don't know veranda or balcony or where do you like to write <laughs> I usually write in bed in the mornings like okay. for just for like often it's for like 15 or 20 minutes before getting my kid up ready for school and um otherwise I'm just at the kitchen table yeah are you a notebook <laughs> kind of person like you have a notebook where you scribble everything or are you a phone uh, on your note, you know, a memo pad, whatever uh, app, or are you a laptop? Oh, I'm, I'm everything. Like, yeah, <laughs> it depends on where I am and what I have. Going You're not carrying a notebook with paper falling out, pages falling out and like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'm writing on my phone and Google Docs just before at after school pickup, you know, mm. you know sort of 10 minutes. Um, yeah, I think it was Pip that taught me that. She, she said that she wrote the new animals in like 15 minute bursts. 
you know, <laughs> in and around a busy life. So right. I think that's the reality for most people, you know. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, I want to just, um, I want to talk, I, I want to know what book recommendations you have, but I want to mention Hiwa, contemporary Maori short stories, Maori short stories. It's really cool um, to see these anthologies and collections and, and just the whole group of Maori writers coming together to, you know, have this work released. You have work in this uh, recent, I can't remember the month, but it recently dropped, Hiwa Contemporary Maori Short Stories. Were you, did someone reach out to you? Did you have to apply to get some work in there? What's the process when all these Maori writers come together? Yeah. And put um, their work in, a, in, in, in such a book? Yeah, I, I, I think I was approached by Paula Morris. I think Paula yes. Morris and She's Darren and Joseph edited yeah. it um, together. So um, grateful to them. And yeah, it's it's a lovely collection of work. And um, I, I guess it's also important to note that not everyone's in it. Like there are such amazing writers who um, right. I don't know for whatever reason may not have been able to contribute something or or weren't approached or mm. you know there are also I guess there are all sorts of decisions that are made and during that in terms of creating an anthology um, mm. and it was really great to see the um, Te Awa Kupu and uh, yes. Now we'd all, I think. Yeah, come it's, out a, it's the, the it's time. two, right? Yeah, like, okay. Yeah, and um, mm. edited by Kitty P. Hanga Wong and um, Vaughan Ropatahana, I think. Mm. Yeah, I've got that right. So, um, yeah, really, really great to see, um, you know, mm. these books come out all, all at once, really, pretty right? much. Yeah, do you think that that's something that you would want to do? Um, maybe be, you know, the editor and and just bringing together, like, would, is that a goal that you have, bringing together a bunch of writers to put a collection together like that? Or not so much, you're happy to contribute if called upon, <laughs> if asked to, if asked to. <laughs> I mean, I'm always up for um, wānaka um, mm. with other writers. And mm. um, I think... There's some talk of one happening at Amarai um, next year, I think, so that some other people contacted me about, some um, Fanoka there. So that's always exciting. But I'm, I'm not sure about collating an anthology. I mean, it would be a, would be a pretty cool project, but I'd probably want to do it with some one else or some mm -hmm. other people, you know, and there are people who are far more experienced in this kind of stuff than me. I feel like I'm such a new kid on the block. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I actually thought you were a new kid on, a, on the block, but then because you've done a lot of different types of writing, so I just don't think of you like that as the new yeah. kid on the block. But in terms of, you know, getting that collection out, I get what you mean. Because when I did research on you, and okay, can I just tell you this? Just... I was like, you were on my wish list for when I finally, I don't know, I think it was on Twitter maybe, that's where I came, I, I said this before, I know I'm not calling it X like everyone's calling it, but I think mm. that's how I came across your work was on Twitter. Someone I was following retweeted something and I was just like, oh, wait, what? Another writer? So I'm always curious, are there Maori, other Māori and Pacifica writers out there releasing work? Then I went to Instagram and I connected there and I made sure I put you on blast there. And then eventually we started following each other. So I added you to the wish list for the podcast. But then <laughs> I didn't reach out because, you know, everyone knows, oh, there's Rosa talking about her podcast wish list. There are people on my wish list that I only interview like a year, a year later or months down the line because everyone's busy. But I was just really, the reason you're on my wish list is because I just put every new Māori and Pacifica writer on there. And I'm, I just... I'm like, when I get the courage, I'm going to reach out. Then you reached out to me first. And honestly, I read it and I was like, she, I, I, she, am I being pranked right now? I think I'm being pranked right now. This can't be real. Like, I was so blown away and had to kind of pause and, and breathe a little. I had to take a big, deep breath because I couldn't believe it. I was just like, 
Uh, no you know, it's way. the whole imposter I... syndrome. It's the whole imposter That's syndrome. That's hilarious. Thing. And we talk about it. We talk about it. If so many people have been on the show. We talk about this whole like, but who are we? Are we really like that whole questioning? So when you talked mm. about, you know, when you talk about imposter syndrome, I'm like, yo, that resonates with me so much. We've had conversations about this, but I was really blown away. And and then, you know, when people are like, oh, I listen to the podcast, I'm like, stop. You do not. <laughs> no, you do not. I'm like, really? No, really? Okay. Am I being pranked again? Like, it's like, it's such a, you know, like, it's, I've got you here online today. It's such a blessing. Like, I've had so many amazing people like yourself. Just everyone that has come on the show, It's it's been intentional um, with the purpose of highlighting, giving flowers to <laughs> folks who are not getting flowers, who have just been working for years and, or even recent, like up and coming creatives, just so many amazing people have come on the show. And I always get super hyped. I always leave thinking you they've shared something that's going to make me better. That's how I look at it. But most importantly is this advocacy work, which is, I want people to know who Emma Hislop is. Right here. No. <laughs> I want people to know that there are, you know, because not like there are people who get a lot of, um, you know, with social media, there are accounts and people who get this huge following and, you know, they're getting huge flowers, but there's also just the average person who's just out there been doing the mahi for years or whatnot and they I, I feel like I want those people on the show to give that recognition and people I find that our people Māori Pacifica don't we shy away from that we shy away mm. from that you know because it's that whole imposter syndrome thing so sorry I take it right back to when I said like I was so shocked <laughs> when you contacted me I was just like oh my god I think I'm being pranked am I reading this right <laughs> and here we are today I say all that to say that um it's mind blowing that you're here, uh, just sharing a bit of you. But I'm, 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 well, I'm excited. Equally <laughs> though, I was equally though I was um, feeling like, oh, Rossa won't probably want to have me on because you know she has, has such amazing people on. So it's kind of like the imposter syndrome is is real. I had, to, I had like... to build up the courage. It's so funny because everyone's like, everyone, I'm like, sorry, it just it took me a few months to build up the courage. <laughs> I have to, unless, you know, I have to just kind of like process, I have to research, um, you know, the work and I have to know um, what I'm saying and highlighting, you know, why I'm bringing them on. It's intentional, it's purposeful. And the hope is always, you know, like you said, with your writing, you never really know how readers are reacting to the stories, mm -hmm. how they're connecting with the characters, if at all, you know, what's resonating with them, what are they taking away? And it's like with the podcast, I just think whether we reach one or a few people or a large number, that that's a, that's what it is, right? Like mm. it's just planting when seeds. Did you start I like it? to say when did we start? Oh my God. Um April 2021. Okay. April 2021 is when we started. And why did you start it? Just did you start um, it? Yeah, I actually yeah, I told the story one time on just once on a podcast. My friend has a podcast and I went on there and I was shocked when they asked that question because I didn't really talk about it. But I was actually doing I started the podcast because I wanted to prove a point. I know that sounds really petty. I know the mm -hmm. Samoan in me was just very petty, but I, I actually was doing a guest spot on another like podcast where I'd go on and share. Uh, I was mostly sharing, like, um, at the time, like, BIPOC authors. Um, you know, obviously, there was the right uprising again in the U.S. And even in international school, uh, the international school scene, there's a lot of talk about, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, justice, um, you know, racism and things like that. So it was just, at the time, it was, there was a lot of talk about that in my own work. As a social justice teacher, that was a huge thing, uh, advocacy, activism. And so I was on the show and sharing books by my favorite authors, uh, middle school, high school books around that, like social justice. And then 
my teacher friends would come on because it was a live YouTube. They would come on for the segment as teachers do. We rally around each other. And they, they were saying to me, oh, you know, like you could, you don't have to be on the show. Like you can do it yourself. Like you can actually have your own podcast. But I was just like, oh, hell no. Like I can't talk to myself. Like who does that? <laughs> People who are really good at that, they do that, not me. Mm -hmm. So I was really, I wasn't sure, but they were planting those seeds that I talk about planting seeds in my mind. Mm -hmm. And then anyway, this podcast didn't go well. There was a bit of a, in the middle of a live broadcast. Oh my gosh. In the middle of this live broadcast, there was a, my f teacher friends, uh, uh, article was quoted and it was misquoted. And so me being the social justice teacher just was like, what? No, that can't be. And my friends were messaging me like, that's a misquote. That's, that's incorrect. Like, why is he saying that? Like, why is he kind of promoting this like neo-Nazi like group as a as a person of as a black person he's got his information wrong but he was like really and I was getting offended because he was mentioning you know black authors that were out there doing the mahi around anti-racism work you know around um anti-bias education things like that and I was you know and my teacher friends were like okay that's it anyway the broadcast went kind of like sour and I just, after that, I just was like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. And the person was more offended about my reaction, but not really processing just the misinformation. So as a teacher on the show, I was just like upset because I was like, you're basically putting out misinformation. And as a teacher, social justice teacher at that, Mm. Sorry, I just can't be there. Anyways, it, it kind of went sour. And then that was it happened at the end of, in the middle of February, this happened, 2021. By the end of February, like about a week and a half later, I had decided I'm going to do a podcast. I know it sounds crazy. I was like, I'm going to do a podcast. In March 2021, we had basically uh, 10 days of spring break. Uh, between the end of Feb and end of March, I spent all of spring break interviewing. I reached out to 10 people and I said, mm. look, um, feel free to say no. I'm going to try and do a podcast. This is the purpose of the podcast, obviously to highlight books, but BIPOC folks, Pacifica, Māori Pacifica folks, let's get, let's do this. In summer, in spring break, at the end of it, I just quickly wrote, a, my brother had like an old beat lying around. I just quickly wrote like this. <laughs> The introduction, the rap. I know, I know. I'm not a rapper. I love I'm not, it. I'm not. <laughs> I need to change it, but it's actually finding time to sit with my brother and actually do it. You know, it's like it's I do so need good. To I love it. it. <laughs> so that's what happened. So basically, in that like like five week space, we had decided. I started a YouTube channel. I reached out to people. I got my first ten guests. I interviewed eight of them before the end of March, April first. We dropped the first episode and it's been going wow. ever since. And I just I love it. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very long story, but that's the story of the podcast. And can I tell you, like the whole imposter syndrome that we talk about, it's a real thing because there are just so many amazing people out there, you know, putting out content and stuff. For me, it was just like my teaching, you know, as an educator, that is my job. Mm -hmm. You know, that is my job where I'm supporting my family and things. i got to do that. And then in the free time that I have, um, when I'm not doing, um, when I'm not with Ngahu Efa, which is like a kapahaka group here, mm -hmm. or with the South, doing things for the Samoan Embassy, I am doing the podcast, which I love. And can I just say that it's brought so many, like just being able to meet so many people through the podcast has been wonderful because I'm not the best public speaker and like I'm I know you're not gonna believe this but I'm like so introverted like but here is like I just want to create like a safe space for people to share and it's been such an honor just to hear the stories that have been shared in this space like I had to always ask myself oh my gosh who am I like seriously who <laughs> who am I I'm oh, so it's, so awesome. it's so awesome to hear that background on, on it. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs>
sorry, that was oh. a very long story. Yeah, I, I do talk a lot. I need to stop. <laughs> oh, no. <Great. laughs> um, you know, health, health and self-care. This is always a question that guests really struggle with because, yeah, how, how do we as Māori and Pacifica take care of ourselves? It's usually putting other people first. So... Yeah, how, what, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, walks on the beach, just really, like, running, what, yeah, what are some of those things, other things that you do just to take care of your health and make sure that you're turning up for your family? It's a good question. I, um, I'm a bit of a workaholic, I think, so, um, in fact, I think it was Alice Teponga Somerville who talked about rest as resistance a while ago. And that was kind of a really good seed um, that they planted in my mind because since then I've just been thinking about how it's a bit crazy just to like work and work. Mm. <laughs> um Obviously, like, as a freelance person, I'm sort of juggling lots of different things. But there was a point a while ago where um, I think it was my partner said that I needed to have at least one day off in the weekend. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there, is, there are things, it's, like, important, you know, to walk, go for a walk outside and, mm. um, yeah, like, just – that's that's a big one for me I think getting outside mm. um and we got a dog about a year ago and um it was funny because I was really resistant to the idea of getting a dog because I just thought oh, I'm going to be the one who has to like run it blah 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 and mm. um I am but I that the dog has been re seriously good for my mental health um mm. Yeah, I um I I have always suffered with a lot of anxiety and depression, and um, just taking Jimmy, our dog, to the beach every morning before I start work, like I drop my kid at school, take Jimmy to the beach, then start work. Um, it's amazing, you know, because it doesn't even matter what the weather's like. Um, Jimmy is just always like so full of joy <laughs> mm. that he just makes me kind of he lifts my spirits because I think it can be really hard to keep your spirits up in this like political climate. Mm. Um, yeah. The world's, you know, the, the world's pretty fucked. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the political climate and um, you know, elections, I know elections are coming up there and my social media feeds like are just full of like, the New Zealand elections and just the I, I'm just like man it's 2023 it's so crazy to me just how confidently people who have those platforms talk about racism or say racist things and and just get away with it I mean I'm like is this New Zealand in 2023 it's so it's scary yeah yeah I know it's always been there but it seems like people are just so confident to just say yeah things <laughs> it's frightening I mean I, I having time off social media is a really important mm. one for me you know because I I um I have an addictive personality and I can get really really attached to my phone and like mm. doom scrolling I think it's called by some people like just kind of getting caught up in the whole kind of disbelief at the right wing kind of rhetoric that's mm. present and our country now and all of that so I just yeah time time off social media is a is a good one for me and rest is resistance <laughs> yes I love that and thank you for shout out to Alice TPS yeah. yes. shout out to Another Alice who was on the show writer. Oh. yeah like you know again like man it's exciting so many of you out there doing the mahi um evolving and growing your craft growing as writers it's really exciting to see a eh? like it's really cool. We want more. <laughs> no pressure, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> what are some book recommendations that you have? Oh my anything god. You want, anything you want to plug or a particular book other than ruin, ruin everyone. Check the bio where you can purchase the book. 
the link will be in there. Please get out and support our Māori, uh, support Fano, support our Māori writers, support, you know, like we say, support our Māori and Pacifica writers. Uh, if we're not doing it, then, you know, who is? Get out there, support. If, if you can't buy the book, follow, um, you know, share it on your story. It goes a long way, fam. So many great books, so many great writers. I I I, I, prob I need to mention um, in terms of nonfiction work, particularly is Talia Marshall, who is um, a Maori writer, another Maori writer, and I just um, yeah, I'm blown away by um, her essays. I think at some stage she's got a book coming out. Um, not sure when, but I'd I'd I'd, I'd look look out for that. And um, oh, just so yeah, so many books. I loved Anthony Lapwood's Home Theatre um, collection, amazing collection, mm -hmm. and um, Maria Samuela's um, collection too, which was mm -hmm. fabulous. Um, yeah, I love Becky Manawatu's work. Oh, I know. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, <sighs> I think I mentioned Shelley Burnfield. Um, in terms of young YA, in particular, Steph Mataku is um, yeah, shout out yeah, Steph. favorite, and also a, an amazing kids book um, came out recently by Michaela Keeble, um, oh. with illustrations by Tokoro Brown. Okay. Um, I think um, where is it? Oh. It's called Paku Man Manu Ariki Fakataka Pokai. Mm. Yeah. And um an incredible, incredible picture book, you know. Yeah. So grateful okay. for kids' books. Do you think you're writing a picture book? You think you might go down that road later on, later later on? You don't want to no write No way. Books? I think I'll leave it to leave that one to the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but also I, I should mention um, Hana Pera Aoke. I'm mm. super grateful for her um, for their art writing, um, mm. in particular because I'm yeah sort of with doing some nonfiction work now. I'm kind of looking into into that a bit. So yeah, I mean I'm I've left people off the list. I'm sure, but there's so many. So many so great many writers. Books. Everyone check the book banner at the bottom. I'm going to try and squeeze some more book recommendations out of Emma um, before we <laughs> cool. post her in the, uh, her interview, uh, podcast interview. Also check the bio. Uh, she has mentioned some of the uh, collections, uh, anthologies, which, you know, that have recently come out. So click on it in the bio, purchase if you can, share it if you can. Uh, get the word out there. If a book was written about you, Emma, what would it be called? And you oh can't say God. ruin. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honestly, I have no idea. I hate to think, actually, to be honest. But yeah, I do need to mention one other favorite book that um, was probably my like favorite book of 2022, and that's mm. Kohine by Colleen oh, Marie yes, Lennon. Yes, yes, yes. It's set part way between Japan, Japan too. And, so. Yes. Have you yes. read it, Rosa? Yes, shout out. Yes, oh, my God. <laughs> you said that was your friend. I was like, oh. oh. <laughs> like, continue, please go ahead. Continue. Yeah, no, just an incredible collection. I just, um, mm. yeah, amazing. Well, we are at the point of the show. You know, you've listened to some podcasts. I just want to say a huge thank you, like, you know, I've shared the long stories already, but um, how we came to be here today, it's just truly an honor. That's all I have to say. I want you to just keep thriving. Um, and, you know, imposter syndrome, oh, it gets all of us, but just, you know, like you have, don't, don't let it stop you. There are more stories to be written. Readers are waiting for you to drop more work. So um, I hope that you can continue to look after yourself first so you can turn up for your family, most important. Everything else will fall into place later. So I just want to wish you uh, all the best as you finish, you know, as the resident, as you continue with your residency and then you get to go home to your loved ones. Um, yeah, just be the best, be happy, and just take care of yourself out there. 
So oh, it's such an so honor. Thank you. Me. It's been a real privilege to be <laughs> in conversation with you today. Mm. I want to ask you before we go one last, one last thought or um, gem or words of wisdom to close the show off. Oh, wow. I just think find one person if you can. You don't need to have a whole lot of like mates to share work with, but just if you even find one person to have a cup of tea with occasionally and 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 talk about what's on top and look at your work, then that's that's helpful. Yeah. And stamp out that imposter syndrome. <laughs> stamp it out. You heard it here. You heard it here, fam. That's Emma. 